when I was six years old, um, an older neighbor in our neighborhood got a slingshot for his birthday. So of course we did what you do. We headed out into the woods to see if we could live off the land and fend for ourselves out there. Um, so my friend Chris uh, brought a target with him to practice and he asked me for help with it. Um, help holding the target for him <laughs> while he shot. Uh, apparently, I wasn't, not only was I not ready to live off the land, I wasn't ready to be out of eyesight from my parents um, in that too. But I, I hold it out, and he pulls the slingshot back, and bam, let's go, and hit me right in the side, right in the opposite side from where I was holding <laughs> the target out. And it hurt really badly. And so Chris was freaked out, and he said, please don't tell your dad. And of course I yelled, mom, <laughs> and ran as fast as I could back into my mother's arms because that's where I wanted to be. That was the one place on earth in that moment where I wanted to be because I knew what I'd find there, that even in that moment, even though I had not made the best decision in that moment, there would be a lecture later, but in that moment I could find love and I could find assurance, I could find healing, I could find wisdom and comfort without judgment no matter how dumb two boys with a slingshot could be. So we have people in our lives like that, right? People for whom mercy triumphs and wisdom abounds. Uh, maybe it's a mom or a grandma or an aunt or a friend or a teacher or a mentor, someone who's loved us with that steadfast, unconditional love, even when we test all the conditions of that love. Um, my mom, there's a picture of her, uh, it's that for me, both when I was a kid and as I grew, even now, she's a source of insight and wisdom, of powerful kindness and unrelenting love. And it was often my mom who saw sacred worth in me when I couldn't always see it in myself. And so now looking back on my story, I see that she was and is for me in so many ways a reflection of God's character, a reflection of God's love. And much of what I've come to know of the divine, I've glimpsed in some way through the way that she lived. And she did it all, as Ginger Rogers said of Dancing with Fred Astaire, she did it all in high heels, dancing backwards on the way. So it's no wonder over and over that that's where I ran in those moments when I was hurting or when I'd hurt um, although I only made that slingshot mistake that one time, <laughs> learned my lesson along the way. So on Mother's Day, we honor the many myriad people who have been like mothers to us on our journey. Um, no matter who you honor on a day like Mother's Day, we honor them in part because we've seen a reflection, a glimpse of God through them in a special way, all right? Which is a beautiful thought. It's a beautiful thought to think of those who've been like mothers to us in that way. But it's also a powerful thought when you think about the implications of what we mean when we say that, that through moms and grandmas and aunts and mentors and teachers and partners, in a real way, we've seen a reflection and a glimpse of the image of God in them. It's powerful and restorative and corrective for me because I think growing up, for me, my default image of God, kind of my assumed image of God, was the old bearded dude sitting on a throne up there, um, basically Zeus, <laughs> just like instead of lightning bolts, throw in love and light and like a little lightning every once in a while if you messed up. But that was just the image that was in culture, that was in the water of the day, and, and it was often the metaphor that I thought and pictured God in, even with all the abundant, amazing women in my life. But as I've grown, I've come to realize that the reality of God is so much more beautiful and complex and nuanced and rich um, than that simplistic issue image or any simplistic image we have, that God is, is not just reflected in bearded dudes on thrones, that the stories of our faith tell us that we see a glimpse of God in people like mothers and grandmothers because, because the feminine reflects God just as much as the bearded masculine dude does. So check this out. Here's kind of where we're going with this. In the first creation story in Genesis 1, um, which is where we get the idea of being created in God's image. Uh, here's how the creation of humankind is described. It says, Then God said, Let us make humankind in our image according to our 
likeness. And so just a pause real quick there. There's our and us, which is interesting um, in that. Uh, there's a lot of conversation about where that's coming from. And, and some think that it's, it's just a royal we, you know, this um, kind of grand way of referring to yourself, or, or simply the limitations of, of language to describe something so beyond comprehension and categorization or singular plural like God. Um, still, others in this particular scripture see a glimpse of like the Trinity um, of the triune God here. You know that Father, Son, Holy Spirit formulation. In those words, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, um, they lean heavily on the masculine in our expression of them, uh, right? That's Father and Son are both guys. But the Hebrew word for Holy Spirit, uh, the Spirit of God, Ruach, is a feminine noun, just, just interesting to me. But I digress. <laughs> so it continues, let us make God in our image. So God created humankind in God's image. In the image of God, God created them. Male and female, God created them. Did you catch that? Right there is this attempt to, to express to us and communicate that the male and the female, the masculine and the feminine, all of humanity is formed in the image of God, equally so. Even despite the limitations of language to describe that, it tries to make it clear that humanity is equally created in the image of God and equally able to reflect the divine character, no matter the specifics of your gender, your masculinity, your femininity. That means that like you and me, all of us, across the infinite spectrum of creation, are created in our diversity in the image of God, beautifully made of sacred worth as we have been built in that image. And so I want to say that clearly <laughs> on Mother's Day, that the feminine is as much created in the image of the almighty God as the bearded dude on a throne picture. And so if you've ever felt that because of femininity, because of your womanhood, that you were somehow less than or secondary to men, or maybe you got the wild idea that you were only worth 83 cents to masculinity's dollar. I don't know where you might get that idea in culture. Particularly if you've ever felt that way because of religion or the church or a message that you've heard, what the church continues to say sometimes and who gets to say it in the church. If you've ever heard that from religion, I'm so incredibly sorry because it is simply not true. <laughs> Male and female, each of those qualities and energies are equal reflections of God. And you, in your particular amalgam of all of that, no matter what, you are created in the image of God, beautifully, colorfully made of sacred worth, able to reflect the character of God and embody the love of God to the world. Whether you do it in, in high heels or wingtips or Doc Martens or barefoot, because God is a creator, not a duplicator. And how you are created reflects the beautiful image of the creator, especially in our diversity. So there's a reason that I glimpsed God through my mom, because she is created in God's image. And at her best, she is a reflection of God's character and love. And at her worst, you know, she's just a reflection of me more than anything else. <laughs> but just imagine what we would think about God and know about God without the reflection of God that we glimpse in our mothers, in our grandmothers, in our mentors, how much more limited our perspective would be. Now, it's, it's important, of course, to, to remember when we talk about these kind of things that God transcends gender. God is beyond those categories of male and female and masculine and feminine. In the writings that are collected in the Bible, um, we're cautioned often not to think about God in limited, like, binary human kind of terms along the way. And so there's this beautiful passage in Deuteronomy where, where God is reminding Moses, the story says, that, that God is bigger than these categories. And we are invited through that telling to remember that too. And so here's, here's what it says to Moses. It says, since you saw no form when the Lord spoke to you at Horeb out of the fire. So he had this encounter with God and, and saw something beyond form. He said, take care and watch yourselves closely so that you do not act corruptly by making an idol for yourselves in the form of any figure 
the likeness of male and female, for instance, or the likeness of any animal that's on the earth. It says God is not male or female. It's something beyond that. And be careful not to limit to those particular images. To remember that we are made in God's image, but God is not made in our image. And limiting God to those creaturely distinctions, that God is male and female, that God is American, that God is a Cowboys fan. Um, well, we, I, we all know that, right? <laughs> um, those reductions are a great way to make some wrong or har- harmful assumptions about who our God is. Instead, God invites us to break free of those molds. It says, it continues in that Deuteronomy 4 passage, the Lord has taken you and brought you out of the iron smelter, out of Egypt, out of, the, out of that mindset of making images and classifications and tangible things of God, out of that to become something different, a people of God's very own, as you are now. It says that in, together, in our diversity, we're called as God's kind of people to be a different kind of people, to be iconoclasts, to be mold breakers, to be a community of a different, bigger, all-inclusive, altogether more God. And so the Jesus community, as Jesus began to unveil this to them, and they began to unite themselves around Jesus' message, they began to catch on to this. And you can hear as they understood what this might mean for them, the exuberance just like bursting off the page as they write about this. Here's one place in Galatians where they talk about it. It says, there is, like in this place, among the Jesus community, there is no longer Jew or Greek, there's no longer slave or free, there's no longer male and female for all of you all of us are one in Christ Jesus. So beautiful that it transcends in some ways those categories, and we're called to do that too. Now, of course, in Scripture, one of the ways that God describes the relationship of the divine with humanity is in, is in parental kinds of terms. Throughout the narratives of faith, God is, is described as like a parent to us, as a parent to God's people, loving us as children. And the writer's of the Bible talk about that and in those ways over and over and over again. And as a parent, God is often described as a father. Of course, you've heard that before, I'm sure. (laughs) That God is like a father, invested and protective and able to shepherd us and God's people through our lives. And that idea of God as a father is such a powerful idea for us, so important for us. But as we see in just a sec, Um, It's not the full story. It's not the only metaphor there. And we can guess that, I think, if you begin to understand that God isn't bound by our distinctions. But still, that idea of God as Father is so incredibly powerful to us. Even if, and maybe even especially if, um, if your human experience of fathers is like that of many of us, uh, it's complicated or perhaps non-existent, the fact that God can step in and redeem and restore and even be a perfect father for us despite our human experiences is so powerful and so beautiful and so hard sometimes too. But God says that God can do this. says, I'm like a father to the fatherless. Defender of the widows is God in his holy dwelling. God sets the lonely in families and leads out the prisoners with singing. It's that kind of amazing fatherhood that God exhibits the ideal of fatherhood that's restorative and higher than we can go on our own. And it's important that God calls us higher because for me, like being a father myself um, just seems like it's one long series of stumbles over Legos and um, being a father in general. But we're called higher and we're set that example. But even more than that, Jesus says that, that in this way, in Christ, that we can relate to the Almighty Father God in this deeply intimate kind of way. And so when Jesus prays that prayer, the, uh, we call it the Lord's Prayer sometimes, our Father who art in heaven. <laughs> when he says Father, it's not like Father like Darth Vader, you know, I am your Father kind of thing. He uses this Aramaic word that's actually a nickname uh, for God. It's like Daddy, Abba, Father, Daddy. <laughs> which makes it a very different prayer when you pray, Daddy, who art in heaven and everywhere. Daddy. It's powerful. But Father isn't the only way that God is described parentally. 
Uh, there are mother metaphors in Scripture as well. It's interesting. <laughs> of course, God as Father is the most common metaphor we encounter, which makes sense because of the world we live in, and even more in the context and times of Scripture was predominated by like father power kind of things. And so we work within and beyond that framework even today, and it's everywhere, and we're influenced in it ourselves. Like even my household is, <laughs> is influenced in it. Uh, my wife told me early in our marriage, you know, Jonathan, for someone who seems so interested in gender equality, you sure don't vacuum very often. <laughs> Sick burn. <laughs> oh, that hurts. The truth hurts sometimes. She's right. Um, we've all got work to do, right? And some of that work that we have to do is to tell the rest of the story in such a way that, the, that I think the church still struggles to do sometimes, but in a way that allows all genders to realize that they belong to God in fullness, as they are. I mean, Crystal and Megan and me and you and you belong to God, reflect God equally and fully as we are, belonging fully in every role and office and position and pulpit. And we miss so much when that fullness isn't present. So a few weeks ago, uh, we have this gathering on Monday nights. We've got one coming up this week called Real Talk, y'all, uh, where we talk about, um, about interesting conversations. We were talking about this particular issue, and I asked, um, what do you think we potentially miss out on when we leave out the feminine reflections of God? And my friend Nate said, you know, we might miss unconditional love. It's an interesting thought, that love that welcomes us comforts us when the slingshots and arrows of this world and ourselves have hit us hard when we come running, unconditional love. And that unconditional love is one of the most common ways that God's relationship to us is described in the Bible. Steadfast love is the way it's described in Hebrew. It's one of the most common descriptions of God's kind of love for us. Chesed, steadfast love, this unending, unconditional, fiercely protective, but always welcoming love. And over and over again, God is described as embodying it and exhibiting it. Places like this, like the Lord is slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love, forgiving iniquity and transgression. And I say Numbers 14, 8 at all because there's so many verses that say almost the exact same thing in Scripture. Steadfast love. And it's a love that sometimes is described as a mother's love in Scripture. So Isaiah 49, 15 says this, can a mother forget her nursing child or show no compassion for the child she has born? I, God, will not forget you. God's love is unwavering and steadfast, unconditional, like the maternal love that reflects it. Or it's a love that comforts us when we get hit with slingshots out in the world. Like Isaiah 66, 13, it says, as a mother comforts her child, so I will comfort you. You shall be comforted in Jerusalem. That's a reflection of God. And it's described like a mother bear's love, <laughs> that God's love is fiercely protective. I will fall upon them like a bear robbed of her cubs, <laughs> it says. And I know we've got a few mama bears out there. Um, that love, that fierce love, is a reflection of God's character protecting the vulnerable. And Jesus even describes the heart like this. It says it's a love that longs and hurts for those who are separated with the depth of a mother's kind of love. Jerusalem Jerusalem, how often I have longed to gather your children together as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings, and you were not willing. This deep, connected kind of love, and there are more than this, but it's pretty powerful, it's pretty cool, it's pretty beautiful to think about the kind of motherly love that God offers to us as well, that chesed kind of love, steadfast, unconditional, tireless, self-giving love. That's God's kind of love, and it's a love that we often see reflected in those that we honor as our mothers. Steadfast, unconditional, self-giving, tireless. <laughs> and they are tireless, aren't they? Even when they're oh so tired, they keep going. And so if we don't do anything else for the moms in your life on Mother's Day, let them take a nap. Um, let that be your gift. It's a beautiful reminder on Mother's Day uh, to think about this. 
The whole spectrum of humanity is created in the image of God that transcends our distinctions and our metaphors, but yet somehow fulfills them at the same time. In some way, our beloved communities are supposed to do the same thing amongst ourselves, to transcend and fulfill. And the way to transcend and fulfill that in our communities is not to ignore our diversity, but to offer equality in our diverse expressions, to honor all of the facets of the image of God expressed in us. And through our mutual equality and empowerment to live within and beyond our distinctions and to do the intentional work among ourselves and among our broken world and unequal systems to go out of our way to make it so among us because we're all better for it. A few years ago, I got to glimpse this with my own eyes. We were at the North Texas Annual Conference, which is this fun meeting where all the Methodists get together across North Texas. And this particular year happened to be the 60th anniversary of the full ordination of women in the United Methodist Church, meaning this time when, when all women could be ordained pastors, and deacons, bishops with no limitations at all. And so they invited as a celebration of that all the female clergy who were there to come to the stage, uh, was younger and older, active and retired, and they filled the stage. And for me, looking at that stage was breathtaking. It's a moment of incredible power, incredible beauty, because I saw as I looked in that group, I saw colleagues like Julie Richter and Jenna Morrison. I saw role models like Mary Brooke Cassad, S. Diana Masters. I saw people who'd helped me become who I am, like Jan Davis and Ann Willett who reflected God's steadfast love and hope to me. And I saw my own mentor pastor, uh, Melissa Hatch, who has mentored me from the beginning and beyond. And as I looked out there, just taking it all in and all these people who were so important to me, the speaker, Danielle Schroer, said something that just opened my eyes that was amazing. She said, look at this amazing collection of ministers. I want you to think about all of the goodness we would have missed, that we would have missed out on if we didn't take a stand for gender equality 60 years ago. Think of what we would have missed. And as I looked, I saw that I would have missed so much, that I would not be who I am without the steadfast love of God that I experienced that was reflected to me through the women and the women leaders on that stage. We need all of us because we need all of God in every reflection. Imagine this place with just dudes. (laughs) Try not to laugh too hard or snort too hard. (laughs) Try not to think about the smells you might smell in this place. But think about how much of God we would be missing and how much richer we are because of you, because of all of us because it's not just my voice that gets to share, but Crystal, we get to hear her perspective and her vision and on and on represented every week. If we want, we want to be a place that honors the fullness of humanity and reflects the fullness of our God in a way that tries to transcend and fulfill who we truly are. And when we honor the reflection of God in each other, no matter age, race, gender, identity, or creed, that empowerment of each other is like a seed that grows us all evermore into the image of God. We're not perfect by any stretch. The church certainly is not. We've made and continue to make mistakes along the way, but we stand in a powerful lineage of faith because of the reflection of God that we've seen in those around us. And it calls us to continue that work, to imagine this place, not with no women, but to imagine what it would be like if every woman heard clearly the church, this place say, you are created fully in the image of God. We see you, we see your mind, we see your heart, we see your work, both unseen and seen in the home and in the community, in the workplace and in the world, and we value it and we need it. We wanna cultivate it and empower it and lift it up. And so today, as you honor the mothers in your life, it is no small thing to honor them because of who they are, for who they are, and honor the ways 
that they have reflected God to you and helped you know the God who loves you with a steadfast, unending, unconditional, brave, motherly love. So let's commit even more to be a community that works to transcend and fulfill and to cultivate the beautiful image of God in which we were all created. Amen? Amen. Let's pray together. Gracious, loving God, (laughs) steadfast, loving God, who loves us like a father, who loves us like a mother, and even more, transcending and fulfilling all we seek, God. Your love is amazing. Forgive us for the times that the church has missed out on so much of you because we've missed out on each other. Help us to be people who recognize your reflection in every place, in every gender, across the spectrum of humanity. Help us to see your image reflected, to empower it, to love it, and to cultivate it in each other. Thank you for our moms, our grandmothers, our aunts, our mentors, our teachers, our partners, all of those through whom we have seen you. Help us to see it even more and to support them in fullness. We pray this in your name.